There you go. Hi everyone, um, I hope you're enjoying your day out so far and thank you for uh, coming into this session on an uh, introduction to, to threat modelling. Um, so hopefully I'm going to give you some useful takeaways whether you've done a little bit of threat modelling or actually it's a term that you've never heard before. Um, hopefully you're going to leave this room thinking a little bit more about it and how it might add value to, to your business. Um, so just a, a few quick intros. So um, I'm from Sakama. Um, we provide a range of services to business to help with our, their cybersecurity. So everything from traditional penetration testing, um, red teaming, um, we're a Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus certification body. Um, we're also able to deliver um, certification against the Internet of Things scheme, so the IoT security scheme. Um, we offer training, vulnerability scanning, and, and my pet baby, which is the Virtual Information Security Manager service. So this is everything that an internal information security manager would normally look after, but actually we can provide a really flexible resource to help you do that as and when you need it. Um, so a little bit about myself. So I'm an ISO 27001 lead auditor. I'm actually also a Cyber Essentials Plus um, lead assessor. My role is director of IT and operations at Sakama. Um, I do have career history working as a CTO um, in a, a large anti-fraud provider service in the legal sector. Um, I've got a number of years experience in helping SMEs getting started on their cybersecurity journey. So that's my particular area of, of passion, if you like. I worked in some really heavily regulated industries, so in, in financial, in manufacturing, in oil and gas, in legal. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a, a little bit of an intro from me. Okay, so let's just look really quickly then about, you know, if you've never heard the term threat modelling, what actually is it? So, primarily, threat modelling is a risk management activity. So, it's not always a, a, a technical exercise, although... Um, you know, you are going to want to have a look into some of the technical detail of what you're threat modeling, but it provides a structured process for having a look at your application, your, your network, your business process, um, and looking at the potential threats that might, um, might present themselves and how that process might be attacked or how it might be vulnerable, or maybe the application that you're developing might potentially, you know, be hacked, if you like. So threat modeling versus penetration testing. So threat modeling is, is non-invasive and, it, and it's a theoretical exercise. So it's a, it's a tabletop exercise as opposed to penetration testing where you actually let some of our guys get hands on and break your application. Threat modeling's done at a much earlier stage. So it's, it's quite often done at design phase before you've actually built anything. And it, and it allows you to almost iron out those vulnerabilities before you've written any code um, as opposed to penetration testing, which will highlight the vulnerabilities after you've built the code and are potentially ready to deploy it. Um, threat modeling is usually conducted using internal resource. So whilst, um, you know, whilst we can guide you through threat modeling, actually the best people to do threat modeling within your business are those who've got a really deep understanding of the process or of the application that you're going to be testing. Um, and as I've just said, it, it helps to identify those threats at a much earlier stage in the process than waiting to do penetration testing once you've already um, deployed a solution or are about to deploy a solution. Um, penetration testing, whilst it absolutely has its value, can be very invasive. So you might find that actually you can only do it at certain times of day because you know, there's a risk that we might actually uh, take down a service that you need, whereas threat modeling, because it's a tabletop exercise, can just give that completely different perspective and not be quite as risky to your BAU operations. Okay, so what kind of businesses should threat model or would benefit from threat modeling? Absolutely anybody developing their own software in-house or using third parties to develop proprietary software for them should be doing threat modeling. Um, I'll come on to a little bit more about, about why and how you might think about it. Um, businesses using lots of third party APIs. So whilst you might not be developing your own APIs, um, anybody consuming um, consuming other APIs or moving data between um, different third parties will benefit from threat modeling. Um, this isn't just about applications and networks. This can also be about business processes. So 
any businesses that have complex business processes, again, where you might be capturing data at one point and moving it you know, through different points within the business, interacting with lots of third parties or clients. Um, so they can also benefit from, from threat modeling those processes. And then this, the next point probably applies to all businesses. So any business for whom data loss could cause massive damage to reputation or potentially result in you know, com major compliance issues should be threat modeling their key processes. Um, and, and again, goes without saying businesses that are holding um, any sensitive data or PII data. Okay, so what kind of systems benefit from threat modeling? So web apps are, are great ones. And again, there's a lot of um, efficiency benefits in threat modeling right at the beginning of you know, considering the web apps and how they might work. Um, threat modeling networks, you know, let's say you're going, you're undertaking a, a restructure of a network, or you know, you may be undergoing some segmentation work. Threat modeling at that point um, in, in that design phase can be really helpful. Um, and again, business processes or even paper-based systems can go through threat modeling. Um, so I don't know, let's say you're, you've got a, a HR system that relies on form filling still and, and handing in. That's also a really good one to threat model. I mean, it's something that gets missed when we're doing some of the more technical testing as well. Okay, so why on earth would you threat model? Um, so as, as I've, I've mentioned already a couple of times, detecting problems early on in software development makes it much kind of uh, more efficient for you to be able to solve that. It makes it a lot cheaper. Anybody who's responsible for your testing budgets or your, um, your coding budgets, um, you, know, you wanna find those things as early as possible in, in that design phase. You can also spot efficiencies and flaws, so maybe actually as part of your threat modeling exercise, because of the, you know, the depth of analysis that you go to, you might find things like capacity issues that you might not have thought about. You might find other design flaws where actually you could have done something just a bit better. Um, you can also help to tease out some security requirements. So maybe by threat modeling, you find that the authentication method that you've considered isn't actually good enough for, for what you're gonna need later on. Um, you can also fix a lot of those problems before before you deploy a, a single thing. You can think about threats beyond the standard attack. So when you're doing vulnerability scanning, when you're doing penetration testing, you're very much focused on those kind of technical vulnerabilities. Threat modeling can help you to think about, okay, so what happens if, um, I don't know, let's say we, we suffer a phishing attack or somebody phones up and pretends to be somebody who they're not. How does that impact what our business processes are and how we interact with that application? Um, it also helps you to understand who your potential threat actors are. So thinking about who's likely to attack your business and how they're likely to do that, what possible entry points that they could use to get in, helps them to target your, your security efforts rather than the kind of broad spray, let's fix all our vulnerabilities. Actually understanding why somebody might be motivated to attack you can, can help you to really focus. Um, you can create a really robust application and then, and then this is, a, I suppose, a key word you see all the time, is it's allowing the business to take a risk-based approach. So actually, yes, you might highlight a vulnerability and it might come up as a, a high risk on a vulnerability scan or doing a pen test. It might score, I don't know, let's, let's give it an eight out of 10. But actually, when you consider that maybe the piece of data that might be leaked through that vulnerability is actually inconsequential to the business, it doesn't really matter if you've got a, a high-risk vulnerability there. Um, so it allows the business to really consider that risk-based approach. Okay, so I get asked quite a lot, when should we threat model? At, at what point in our, in our software development life cycle or at what point in our business process should we threat model? Um, for software development, it depends entirely on your, your, your approach. So if you're using a waterfall approach to software development, Absolutely, once you've got all of those requirements and you're looking at design at the beginning, that's when you should threat model. For businesses who develop using Agile or any kind of um, flavor of Agile, if you like, you might actually choose to threat model 
um, smaller pieces of your application as those sprints are coming up to release. Um, so the other time you may, you may choose to do it is prior to deployment, so you can make sure you've got those incident response plans and you've got your um, business continuity plans written off the back of having done a threat modeling exercise. Um, you'd always do one if you're doing significant system change or an upgrade or you're adding a new major piece of functionality. Let's say you're, you know, you're consuming a new API or the, where you're gonna store the data is different or how you authenticate is different. Those kind of um, system changes would trigger a threat modeling activity. And then I suppose this one's particularly relevant at the moment in response to the world around us. So who knew four years ago that we were gonna have a global pandemic and that actually that was gonna be used against businesses to, you know, to cause problems and to create context for hackers, if you like. Who knew that we were gonna have a, another kind of huge war um, and actually all of a sudden our threat actors have changed. Um, so those kind of significant world events should trigger another threat modeling activity because actually the threat landscape based on that has changed. Okay, so the outcomes of a threat modeling activity. So the major outcome you'll get is a data flow diagram that show all of the different entry points into a system. So let's say you're using a, a web application, you would actually come up with a, a data flow diagram that will highlight you know, the ways you could access the, the database in the background, the way you could interact with the, the login page, the way you could interact with the infrastructure. So you come out with a really detailed kind of, I suppose, map of how, um, how an attacker could potentially gain entry. Um, the, the real value is you'll end up with a prioritized list of potential vulnerabilities that then you can decide whether you're gonna treat, uh, you're gonna insure against, you're gonna you know, fix them before they go live or actually you need to train your internal staff on. So it gives you that full picture um, and you can prioritize it then based on your own business's appetite for those risks. You absolutely, certainly, every time I've done this with an organization, they've come out with non-security related um, benefits as well, like business efficiencies. So when you actually lay it all out and when, you, you know, when you're re-looking at your design and you're looking again at your infrastructure, there's, there's always other efficiencies to be made. So actually, maybe we don't need this type of um, storage. Maybe we can actually rely on this type of storage because it's gonna save us a lot of manual effort in terms of scaling, or it's gonna save, save us a lot of manual effort in terms of you know, different verifications that we might need to do. The other thing that you'll come out with then is contingency plans. So your, your business continuity plans, your um, recovery plans, they can all be influenced by the threat modeling activity um, because actually you're looking at all the, what could possibly go wrong um, well in advance. So by the time you come to you know, testing, you already have a really good idea of what could possibly go wrong and it's really easy to write contingency plans at that point. Okay, the, the other question I always get asked from clients when we do this with them is, okay, who do I need on my side of the business to be involved in this? And it's a really good question. So you always need somebody who has deep knowledge of what you're testing. So for you know, threat modeling with software, you would want the developers, so those with really intimate knowledge of the, the, the web app itself, because actually those people are the best place to be able to say how this works, how it fits together, you know, what could possibly go wrong. And we'll come on to some frameworks later on that you might use to guide that conversation, but you absolutely need your, your you know, the person who knows that really well. Let's say we're threat modeling a HR process. You absolutely want those boots on the ground who are working with that process every day because they know all the little kind of routes that those, form, those forms travel through. And at what point do we send off to do a DBS check? And at what point do we send off for our referencing agency? So yeah, you absolutely need those kind of process experts. You also need those in the business who have knowledge or the relationships with the third party. So if you're consuming APIs, you absolutely want um, you know, people in your business who know those APIs in detail or who have relationships with those, those third parties that you're interacting with. This is not something that can just be done by one person. It, it does need to bring a group together. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a, 
a look now into the different approaches to threat modeling and you know at a really high level how it's done and then we'll look through some of the, the frameworks that you you know you might want to have a look at after this session. So there are two different approaches to threat modeling. We have an attack alert um, and a system-led focus. Um, so an attacker-led focus um, looks at the actual threat actors that might pose a risk to your business. So it looks at, okay, from the point of view of somebody who is motivated by the fact that I test our animals, so we're a, a hacktivist. Actually, what is important to that, that type of attacker and where might they look to you know, gain the biggest kind of value to their time of taking down my animal testing website? Um, it might be that if you, you're, you, know, you work with a business where you might be targeted by financially motivated attackers, where might they be looking? So it allows you to really focus your testing on the threat actors to your, your business. It focuses on entry points as opposed to the, the system as a whole. So it's, it's all about the kind of testing the, the outer walls, if you like. <clears throat> um, it also allows you to focus on the, just the critical assets. So, you know, about keeping the thing up and running. And the emphasis is on protecting those critical assets as opposed to the entire system. So we were talking about the differences between an attacker-led and a system-led approach. So attacker-led focuses on the entry points, system-led focuses on the system as a whole. So actually there are different circumstances where you might use these different um, types of threat modeling approaches. Um, you tend to use a system-led approach where you're handling really sensitive data or actually you might have a risk of insider threat. So whereas a tackle-led would focus on entry points into your business, you might choose to use a system-led approach where you might already have somebody you know, within the business, we don't like to think about that, that actually could cause that data compromise. And we're looking at you know, things like transferring data between departments, and we're looking at things like access control within the business, as well as just how could we breach this outer perimeter. Um, you'll also, as part of a system-led approach, consider wider business assets. So you'll be thinking about, you know, cloud storage. You'll be thinking about, you know, you might even be thinking about the filing cabinet in the in the HR office, for example. Okay, so at a really high level. Now, this is a ridiculously high level, but we're going to go through this. This is how you threat model. Okay, so there's only four stages. So in the design stage you're looking at what are we building? So what are we gonna to put together? What does this process look like? What does the application look like? The most important part and where you need this intimate knowledge of, of the system is what possibly could go wrong. How could we break it? How could somebody else break it? Then you've got the what can we do about it? How do we fix it? How do we change our plan so that actually you know, what we've identified as something that could go wrong isn't going to materialize. And then the last part, which is where your kind of vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, auditing activities come in, is the, did we do a good job of fixing what we thought could go wrong? Now, the most important part of this process is in that how do we break it um, part, because actually if we don't do a good job there, we've not got a comprehensive threat model, we've only got a partial model. So, one of the ways that Sakama work with clients to enable them to you know, have this really detailed understanding is we ask lots of questions. What would happen if? What would happen if this happened? If that doesn't go where we expect it to go, what could the outcome be? If this piece of information was made public, what could happen? If the wrong person in your business knew this, what could happen? And that's the really important part, and that's the part that takes a long time um, and should take the longest is the what could possibly go wrong. Um, <clears throat> now I've said that actually one of the outcomes of this exercise is um, a prioritized list of, um, of risks to this, this application or this system that we're testing. So to do that, we have to have a risk scoring methodology. Now there are many risk scoring methodologies out there. I quite like this one. So looking at the, the DREAD acronym, so damage, how bad would it be if this went wrong? Reproducibility, how easy is it for me to carry this out? Exploitability, how much knowledge or resource do I need to actually, to actually launch this attack and exploit this? Um, how many of my users would it impact? 
And how would I know that this had happened? How easy is it for me to know that, let's say, um, how easy is it for me to know that a password has been shared? It's quite difficult. And there's a little calculation at the bottom there that would give you kind of a, an objective risk score. And that's what would allow you to prioritize you know, all the different vulnerabilities that you found in your threat modeling exercise and decide which ones you're going to tolerate, which ones you're going to treat, which ones you're going to fix before it goes live, which ones are okay to be left a little bit longer until it's already gone live, or which ones are we actually just going to say we accept that risk or we'll ensure against it. <coughs> okay, so let's have a look then at some of the threat modeling frameworks that we can use. Um, so these ones are, this is a non-exhaustive list and each framework actually provides guidance as to the kind of things you should look at. Um, they go into different levels of detail and there are some specialist frameworks out there for, you know, for specific purposes as well. So the first one we'll go over is Stride. So if you've worked much with any of the Microsoft stack, you'll know that Microsoft used this, this methodology for threat modeling. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. So Stride is for high level modeling. It's, it doesn't go into lots of detail like some of the other um, some of the other frameworks, but for that reason, it's a really good one. If you're not already doing threat modeling, Stride is a really good place to start. Um, it's applicable to all kinds of applications um, or any kind of, you know, the business process testing that we talked about. And it focuses on kind of high level attack categories as opposed to um, the specific minute detail of how this attack might happen. Um, so Stride, um, is obviously an acronym and stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of privileges. So they're the, the categories of risk that you would look at when you're threat modeling your application or your process. So you might say, okay, um, how do we know that this user is actually this user? And that's one of the questions you'd ask yourself. Okay, we know that because, I don't know, we track the IP address that they log in from. Okay, what if somebody's using a VPN? How do we do that then? So it's those kind of, it's a starting point for the questions that you're gonna ask yourself about what it is that you're threat modeling. Um, what extra checks do I do before I let this user visit an admin page? Um, careful, because that's how mine started just with a sneeze. Um, <laughs> you know, how, how do we double check that, you know, they've not just typed slash admin into the URL? Oh, sorry, I really didn't realize I was on the right slide then, so there's the, that's the stride ones. Um, we've also got the OWASP top 10, so anybody who's worked in cybersecurity will probably have heard of the OWASP top 10. So this is very application focused. It's updated every few years with the most common vulnerabilities in web apps. Having said that, the updates are, are usually kind of fairly minor. There's still those same vulnerabilities that keep cropping up. And actually, I can, if you speak to any of our pen testers, they'll tell you that they still very regularly find OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities in you know, recently developed web apps. Um, and this is used to eliminate some of the low hanging fruit. So making sure that there's no possibility that we've written a SQL injection into our web app code. Um, again, if you speak to any of our testers, they will be um, they will tell you how often they still find SQL injection. Um, this one is the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which again, if you've worked much with it, within cybersecurity, you'll have heard of. So the MITRE ATT&CK framework is probably one of the most detailed frameworks that you'd use to do threat modeling. And actually, you know, if we're doing this system-led approach, then the MITRE ATT&CK framework is is a, is a really good one to look at. So it identifies 14 tactics that attackers use and actually goes into re real detail about the specific goals that those attackers um, may want to achieve and how they might do that. So under each tactic, you've got a, a list of sub tactics and it actually, you can follow um, each category of attack through as to, you know, how they, might, um, how they might exploit the SQL injection, how they might then exfiltrate your list of users, what they might then do with those passwords is actually a really good way to do it. Um, and each, you know, each sub-tactic describes the method that attackers would use. So whilst it goes really deep and, and is you know, very detailed, actually it's so prescriptive that it's really easy to follow. Um, 
so that, yeah, that gives you a really comprehensive and detailed guide if you're doing a, a system-led threat model. This one is a privacy-specific um, threat model um, called Linden. So I'd maybe use this if you're threat modeling on um, a system where you've got PII data held. And there's actually no reason either why you can't use a combination of threat models. You can start with a stride. And then you might discover, actually, we've got a big privacy issue here. So why don't we um, use the Linden model to um, model this part specifically using Linden? Um, and, and again, it just provides guidance as to the kind of questions that you want to ask about your system. So, you know, linkability, how do we link pieces of data together? Um, you know, how do we make sure that information's not being disclosed to anybody it shouldn't be? How do we make sure it's not leaving, you know, the EU or the, the, the verified countries? How do we make sure that we're not at risk of any non-compliance against the privacy standards well, of whatever country that we're working in? So yeah, this is a privacy-specific framework. And like I said, there are other specific frameworks out there for, for different purposes. And it's all about just finding the right one for, you know, for the type of testing that you're doing. OK, attack trees. So this is a specific exercise that allows you to detail how, um, how an attack might happen for your specific system. Um, and I'll show you an example of one in a second that's completely non-application focused, but I think it always sticks in my head as a really good one. So for each layer of the attack tree, so an attack tree works a little bit like, a, um, you know, like an org chart where you've got a tree diagram. So for each layer of the tree, you're asking what does the attacker need to complete this step? Um, I'll show you the next slide because it puts into context a little bit. So this is the Ocean's Eleven heist. So the ultimate goal is to rob the casino. I can't claim credit for this one, by the way. I did a little bit of research and this was about the best one I could find. So I have credit it at the bottom of the slide there. Um, so the ultimate goal is to rob the casino. Okay, how could we possibly rob the casino? So we could breach the vault, raid the registers and grab the money and run. Okay, so to complete each of those steps, what do we need? And you can see that each time you drop down the layers, it's building up a picture of actually what you need to, to be able to do that. Now, the goal for threat modeling is to make sure that as early on in that process, we take away the hacker's ability to complete the next step, because actually it's much cheaper and easier often for us to you know, to prevent that attack earlier on in the chain. So these attack trees um, are a really good way of figuring out how early in the process we can actually stop the attack. Um, so yeah, one of the outcomes of doing the threat modeling activity is to be able to have a look at these trees and figure out at what point we're, we're gonna stop that. Um, I'm gonna do something I don't normally do actually now, guys, and just ask are there any really quick questions. If there are any detailed questions, I can, you know, we've got a stand-up surgeon, you can always come and say hi. And apologies for having a, a health meltdown in the middle of my presentation. I clearly didn't threat model that part when I was writing it, did I? Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. Hi. Do you want a mic? Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lady just in the middle who wanted to ask. Sorry, can you <laughs> just got a microphone there? Hi there. It's a really easy one. Could you put your stride slide up there? Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you so that. much. Not a problem. That one, I can answer that one. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Was there any other questions? Just one. Um, risk is usually defined as a function of. Uh, uh, the, the impact of a breach and the probability. Uh, when you defined risk, it didn't seem to have anything to do with probability. So, it, obviously this is not risk in terms of like a, a, a business risk, ISO 27001 style risk. I'll find the slide that I did on risk. Um, because the cal there are different ways, this is a way of calculating risk. Okay, so the risk value, the reproducibility, I suppose, is the probability because it's the ease of it happening. So it does cover the same kind of stuff. They're just labeled slightly differently. Um, so the, the reproducibility, the exploitability is, I suppose, the likelihood. If it's, if it's not going to be easy to exploit, it's unlikely that somebody who's financially motivated will go after it. If it's something where, you know, because it, it, 
you've got to think of hackers, especially when they're financially motivated of operating a, a little mini business, if you like. So this is a, it's, it's an alternative way of calculating it. It still does take into account um, likelihood and impact. So the damage and affected users is the impact. The reproducibility, exploitability, and discoverability, I suppose, is going to be your, your likelihood. Any others? Hi. Can we? So we are husband, wife, and we are doing uh, like we have a degree of cybersecurity with artificial okay. intelligence. So I have. Uh, I want to ask one question. Like uh, the feature of penetration testing in IT security will be driven by uh, like IT, uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning. Is it right? Sorry, so your question is about penetration testing. So like a future of penetration yeah. testing in IT security yeah. will be driven by artificial intelligence or machine learning. Is it right? Do I think that's right? My opinion, do I think that's right? Yeah. Um, Thank you. No, I don't think it's right. So, so the question was, do I think that um, penetration testing will ever become fully AI driven or fully machine learning driven? Um, no, I don't. I don't think that will ever be the case. Um, so karma pay me to say that, so I have to say no. No, no I don't think that will ever be the case because I think, you know, if it is, it's not going to be in my career time. Um, there, is, there is still so much that get missed by um, automated testing tools. Um, and things like this can't be done by automation because actually it's going to be really hard to train a model as to the inner workings of your paper-based system or your, the inner workings of your business processes. So people are still are going to be a huge risk and we can't train AI to outthink the people yet. So that's my opinion. Yep. I've got time for one more and then we'll leave it there. Sorry, you mentioned the importance of breaking things yes. in your model. Um, how, whenever I have the conversation about what could break, the instant response from my development team has always been, oh, but we've thought of that and we're fixing it with this. How important is it to have the conversation about what breaks and then move on to the conversation of how it fixes it? Yeah. Or can you have that conversation at the same time? So I actually think you need to separate the two. Okay, otherwise you're never gonna get that complete picture. And it's the same, so if you're doing, um, so spoke, spoke before about risk management, if you're doing risk management for ISO 27001, the first job you've got to do is to score your risks without having applied any controls. So, okay, we know you've already got two-factor authentication, but actually what would that risk be if, if we didn't pretend we've not put anything in place? So you need to have that conversation first about, I know you've, you're working on something, but what is the risk without that? Because actually that shows you the value of the other piece of work that they're doing. Um, and it allows you to make that good decision about is that the right way to do it? Or actually is this risk so great that the piece of work you're doing to fix it is never gonna bring it down to within a risk we can tolerate. And actually we need to do something else or we need to insure against it. So it's, I think it's really important to have those conversations separately. Um, and it's a tough sell in terms of, you know, nobody wants to admit their own child is ugly. Um, but, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, it's better to have that, okay, let's pretend that you do nothing and then let's talk about the value you're also adding by making that fix. Thank you. That's right. Um, right, guys, so camera on a stand upstairs. So if you do have any more questions, I'm happily to talk about threat modeling all day long. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.